When you think about civil engineering, or even structural engineering specifically, you think it's a single path. You take one direction, there's only one career path. However, there's a broad range of areas that you can focus on that are vastly different to each other. And just because you pick one stream doesn't mean you can change over to the other ones. So let's break down the different types of areas that you can focus on with your career. What are the differences and the similarities between them? So you can understand where you wanna go and if you wanna take this as a profession. Now, structural engineering specifically is a subdiscipline of civil engineering. So to get your structural engineering course, you need to take a civil engineering degree which is even broader than the subdiscipline of structural engineering. Structural engineering in specifically looks at buildings and structures, how the stresses flow through them to make sure they can stand up. Specifically, when you're looking at buildings, we essentially create the bones for the human body where the architect creates the outer appearance. So we make sure a building stays up and safe, where the architect makes sure how it appears and how it operates. So let's break down the vastly different areas of even structural engineering that you can do and how it can take your career in different paths we typically look at the actual buildings that we live in and use every day. So we have a significant impact that we can have on the variety of people about either how efficient we make the buildings or how safe we keep the people in there. As if we go wrong, we can potentially affect a lot of lives. So this is the sub-discipline that I love. I love to see the built environment and what I can create and show some of the amazing architecture that I can bring to life. So essentially we work closely with architects to help bring their dreams into reality to make sure they're safe, reliable, so that everyone can use them and enjoy them every day. We get quite often confused for another subdiscipline of this, which is civil engineering, or specifically heavy infrastructure in civil engineering. So what is civil and what is heavy infrastructure civil engineering? Well, it's looking at about big retaining walls to make sure you can cut through the building and keep it safe. You're potentially putting up rock barriers to stop rocks from falling down over the road that you're driving over. Potentially looking at culverts, so that means the road can go over the top while water is flowing underneath or even underpasses and undercuts. They're looking at the heavy loads of infrastructure to allow our road system to actually operate and function. They could even be looking at big mining areas. So a lot of times, typically you need heavy civil infrastructure to build those big mine sites to make them operational. As there's a lot of excavation work, retention of slopes. So what steepness do you need to put a slope at and how can we make sure it's retained in the right way? So looking at geofabrics and other elements. So they're typically looking at structures that are retaining heavy loads for vehicles that are moving over them. Heavy infrastructure can even look at things such as the sky rail that they're currently building in Melbourne. A lot of time there's a lot of crossover here as the skills are cross reference So sometimes you'll have building engineers operating in the civil engineering space and heavy infrastructure, but typically where they specialize their skill sets is really in those big retaining walls and big groundwork structures. So making sure they're retaining a lot of soil and having those culverts. That's more where they shine. Another aspect that's more spoke and specifically for that heavy infrastructure is dams and waterway management. So those big elements that have got heavy amounts of structure in them that a lot of people rely upon. If you didn't have a dam, you wouldn't have your water supply. So we're looking at water supply management and making sure that you have enough water when you need it. Another one that's basically a standalone discipline is bridges. So bridges are quite unique in how you have to design them. And they can have a variety of forms, whether they be trusses, whether they be girders, whether they be suspension bridges. And it's about how can you actually make that bridge be built, some of the temporary works, which sometimes govern those designs. What are the different options that you have into and the complexities of having these big span structures that can be moved in the wind and have a lot of dynamic effects. So they need to focus on how the dynamics of the bridge actually works. Some of the bespoke nature of having a big structure that can expand and contract over time as they really log spans and they're subject to the temperatures of the sun, they can have big movement joints that people need to watch out for. They also need to focus on how the temporary works to get it from where it is to the final state is typically you want to span long distances. And so having additional infrastructure underneath it to support it in the temporary state is potentially not the right way and potentially very disruptive. They also need to make sure they need to have longevity as a lot of times as they're big elements, especially bridges, it's not something you only want around for 50 years, like a house. It's something that you want around for hundreds of years. So you need to look at sustainability and the durability of the structure and potentially even maintenance works in the long run. Another one that's typically split off from building engineering, especially in the more complex stuff, is earthquake engineering. Sometimes earthquake engineering can just be on sub-discipline due to the complexities of designing for earthquakes. It's more than just looking at the loads and making sure your building can resist it. It's looking at the dynamic actions of how those forces are actually applied. An earthquake, it shakes backwards and forwards. As that building moves backwards and forwards, there can be damage applied to it. So how do you design a detail such that the building can resist those loads? Now you might think, let's just make it as stiff as possible. 
but it's not always the best path as that makes the loads higher. So the higher stiffness you make it, the higher the load you need to design for. So it becomes this little loop where what you want to try and do is dissipate those forces. So in a big enough event, your building can become softer over time. Yes, that softness does mean damage, but provided you can control that damage in a specific way, it makes it really easy to look at how the building behaves and reduce the loads. Yes, the building will need to be prepared, but it's better than over-designing the structure for having additional forces in it and just making it super stiff. So typically things in seismic engineering or earthquake engineering, for example, are looking at risk mitigation. So what is the damage potential? So what is the loss from the damage that you see? Looking at damaging a structure in a specific way, so you need to truly understand structural behavior so you can make sure you're designing the building so it can fail in a specific way that is controlled and that doesn't cause a catastrophic collapse. Another discipline that you may think is not as complex as you think it is, but it's actually more complex than you actually believe, is foundation engineering. See, foundation engineering has to deal with soils. The problems with soils are very uncontrollable and very unknown as you're dealing with an unknown source that can change over time. So a lot of times, especially in the more bespoke foundation designs, you can have people that specialize in foundation designs, especially big structures. So they may be doing piling designs, they may be doing other bespoke retention systems. So you're looking at how the foundations and how you can retain soil and some of the more specific areas where you can save a lot of money if you do it the right way. So this is where you potentially have a person that just does foundation designs, but a lot of times they can also be a geotechnical engineer at the same time. Now, geotechnical engineers quite often not think about structural engineering or civil engineering as it's more about testing and understanding soil behavior. But a lot of time they can go hand in hand and they've actually taken a structural or civil engineering degree to get to where they've got to. So if you like a lot of outdoors, you like a lot of testing, you like a lot of soil sampling and seeing how structures actually behave under these, those unknown conditions, that's potentially where a geotechnical will be. A lot of time they won't be inside doing calculations. They'll be out in the field taking measurements and understanding the soil that you need to build your building on top of. Fire engineering is also one of those ones that a lot of people overlook and don't really think about. However, when you're going to a more complex design, you can get a lot of savings through having a proper fire engineer design behind it. Isn't fire engineering about just stopping the fire? Well, no, it's about understanding structural behavior, about what elements you can fail, how can you analyze to see how heating up those elements will weaken them over time and how you can find alternate low paths, knowing where you need to strengthen in the right conditions. So they need to know a lot about how do structures heat up over time, how heat reduces the strength of a material. So you need to know a lot about materials, factors of safety. So this is where it can be very broad and typically people with a fire engineering background need a PhD in structural behavior and fire engineering. It's you need to know how the fire is actually going to be involved and some of the aspects of reducing it. So can you have sprinklers that help reduce it over time so that you can design for a lower strength? Can you allow specific elements to fail but doesn't cause a catastrophic collapse. It may not be pretty, but the building doesn't actually collapse. Most of the time, structural engineers think they do fire engineering, but they're really just doing the prescriptive based approach where a fire engineer will take an FEA model. They'll heat it up over time with curves that reduce as the temperature increased. So then they can see how the building's failing to achieve the required level of FRL while still maintaining a lot of efficiency. So these ones that we're talking about, like earthquake engineering and fire engineering about saving money and having additional structure elsewhere. So strengthening the structure as you need to. So they need to have a really detailed understanding of structural mechanics and how materials behave in both these disciplines. So all of these structures sort of fall underneath the same path, especially when we're talking about civil engineering. They need to understand low paths. They need to understand structural mechanics. They need to understand how materials behave. Is the material brittle? Is the material good under compression? Is the good material good under tension? How can I strengthen it? How can I detail it? And how do I need to analyze it to make sure that I'm getting the correct answer? But in the end, it's all about structural safety to make sure your buildings understand and withstand the loads that they need to be designed for. How you progress your career is very similar. So I've got a link to a video here about the 10 traits that every engineer needs to have to progress their career and be better at the profession and get that next pay rise. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, there's two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon members. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. As always, stay curious and I hope to see you next time. Bye.